Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network. This is the TeacherCast Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jeff Bradbury. We are having a great show. My guest today is Ross Cooper from Salisbury School District in Pennsylvania. Today, he's going to be talking to us about his one-to-one initiative and something called Innovate Salisbury. Ross, welcome to the show today. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm great, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Talk to us a little bit about yourself, man. I see you all over the place. You're on Twitter. You're on Facebook. You're doing presentations. It's nice to see you here on the show. Who is Ross Cooper? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I've been in – well, thanks. I'm flattered. I've been in education now for about um, about eight years. Started off at half a year in third grade. Six years in fourth grade and absolutely loved it. Uh, got really involved in technology, particularly Apple technology, but obviously the brand is what matters. It's what works for the students. Uh, a lot of technology, a lot of inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, STEM, full supporter of you know anything and everything inquiry-based learning. Did a uh, then I left the classroom, maybe a little too soon, who knows? And then I um, did a year as an assistant principal, and now I'm really what my passion is is inquiry-based learning and uh, curriculum and instruction, and I'm doing that now in the Lehigh Valley in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, K through 12 curriculum supervisor in a one-to-one MacBook and iPad school district, and I couldn't be happier. And, and that's what we're here to talk today about: is these one-to-one initiatives and how they're forming in school districts. Now, you're new to this school district, but this one-to-one initiative started a while ago. Talk to us a little bit about Salisbury. What kind of a school district is it? What's the demographics? How does Salisbury run, and how is it similar or different than any other school district in America? Okay, so there's two elementary schools, a middle school and a high school. You have about 1,600 students in all. And you made a great point regarding, um, yes, I mean, the the work for the one-to-one was absolutely done before I got to the district. I'm just kind of hopping on board. So I definitely don't want to take the credit for implementing the one-to-one. That was the work of uh, mostly my amazing superintendent, Randy Ziegenfuss, who I know you've interacted with, and my assistant superintendent, uh, Lynn Feeney-Hedden. And we also have a great uh, technology director. His name is Chris Smith. So they were the masterminds uh, for the most part. Obviously, everything's a you know a group joint effort, but for the most part, they were the masterminds from the administration level uh, behind the one-to-one initiative. And I think that was about three to four years ago. And um, you know, they started, I believe, with the white clamshell MacBooks. Um, 13-inch white clamshell MacBooks that we've all seen in education, and now they've kind of gone by the wayside. And now we're looking at the silver 13-inch MacBooks. They try out the uh, MacBook Airs as well. Um, and a lot of the students, particularly at the high school in the, uh, in the creation classes, you know, Photoshop, Final Cut Pro, and things like that, found out that the MacBook Airs weren't powerful enough, so they went with, uh, they went with the MacBooks. And, you know, like, imagine that. Like, you don't know what device to go with, you put it in the hands of the students to see which you know which works best, and that's what you go with. You know, it makes it makes sense, but sometimes we don't do that. But but you know, when I heard they did that, I'm like, wow, like that's practical. Like that's the thing to do. So that's how they decided on the current MacBooks. It's on a lease model, um, and it's one to one MacBook um, two through twelve, one to one iPad K and one in elementary school. The devices stay in the building. At the other levels, they go home. They take them to and from school. And Chris Smith, our technology uh, director right now, is working on um, some type of you know model, some type of plan, so the students could actually hold on to their devices over the summer. Devices are loaded up with software uh, through a consortium. I believe all of the MacBooks have the entire Adobe suite on them, which is pretty awesome. Um, just you know, all the technology you could possibly want. Uh, looking into getting some more iPads, but of course, at the end of the day. Um, it comes down to, you know, how you use the devices. And, you know, we could talk all day about the technology and the toys we have. But what matters most is the pedagogy and the students and how the devices are being used. And because of all that great Apple software, you guys were recently identified as an Apple Distinguished Program. What does that mean and what does all that entail? It's, um, I believe this was our third time. You have to renew it every couple of years, every two years, I believe. So this was our third second or third time being recognized and basically saying we're doing innovative things with technology, Um, you know, hosting site visits, doing what we can to support Apple. Apple supports us. Uh, Randy and I went out to Cupertino um, a couple months ago to talk about a strategic plan, just basically getting, you know, 
any and every support from Apple in regards to what we're doing, um, you know, in our school district. But basically, you know, more or less Apple pegging us as, you know, this is an innovative district. They're, you know, they're setting the standard. They're taking the lead with innovative use of technology. That absolutely sounds fantastic. And there's been a lot of other rewards. I, I want to just kind of start off the show by sharing that. You've also been named a Project Red Signature District. What is that? Hmm. Honest, honestly, I couldn't give you as much information about that. I believe that's tied. I don't know who that's through, but I believe that's tied to technology as well and innovation. Nice. So that, that's something I'd have, to, I'd have to Google the exact specifics. But I believe it's another technology innovation type thing. So let's talk a little bit about the journey here. Um, you are currently one-to-one. Obviously, you're dealing with iPads and, and, and MacBooks and MacBook Pros, and you're really trying to put the technology where it belongs, how it belongs, to give the kids the best opportunities to, to really reach out and be innovative. When mm-hmm. you're in a school district where everybody's using technology at various levels, how do you define the word innovative? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think so – in doing a, a uh, presentation on innovation uh, not too long ago at an ed camp, you know, I, I, think, I think it's one of the things we talked about, how it differs based on your individual context. So, in our, for, for example, in our particular school district, if, never, if nobody's ever done something like, you know, a makerspace before or using or leveraging ed camp for professional learning for teachers or um, genius hour, 20% time, that would be innovative within our particular context. And that would be us moving forward. As long as we're doing it for worthwhile reasons, not just so we could say that we're doing it. Whereas in other districts where they might be a little bit further ahead, say, is, you know, even something like high tech high out West, um, you know, for them, it might be kind of like been there, done that. Um, so it wouldn't be necessarily classified as innovative. Um, but I think it's important not to innovate for the sake of being innovative. Like, for instance, just because you've been there, done that doesn't mean you can't do it again if it's not working. I think a lot of times we're just searching for the newest, latest and greatest thing just to say we're moving forward when maybe what we're doing is already working. You're the supervisor of curriculum. Is that the right title? Uh, yes. Uh, supervisor of instructional practice. It's all curriculum. It's just a fancy. Yeah. So keeping with the theme of innovation here, I'm curious to your point of view, does curriculum drive innovation or does innovation drive curriculum? Well, that's interesting. Um, I would say the student, I'm going to flip that on its head a little bit. I'll say the students needs drive everything. You know, it's not, you come into a district, this is my first year with ideas of what you want to do, what you think you have to do, what you think um, the teachers need or what the students need. And, And basically it all comes down to what the students need. So that involves getting into classrooms as much as I can. Um, I would like to get into classrooms more, but I try to get into every school on a daily basis, uh, not a daily, on a weekly basis. Four schools, try to get into each one at least um, on a weekly basis. And I, I think it's about what the students need. And a lot of that's driven by curriculum, um, by, you know, whether it's something like close reading, whether it's project-based learning, whether it's inquiry-based learning under which project-based learning falls under, um, whether you know, whether it's just, you know, collaborative activities, whether it's getting the students, I think on a higher level, whether it's fluency, I think, I think all those nuts and bolts need to be in place um, along with innovation. That doesn't mean you can't innovate at the same time, but you can't put the cart before the, uh, you can't put the cart before the horse. I think what you can do though, is you could innovate. And this is something I've been thinking about actually for a future blog post. You could innovate, you could do something like 20% time, but then you could look at what makes 20% time um, effective. So you might say something like student creativity. You might say something like the inquiry. You might say something like autonomy, students being able to p- pursue their passion. So what are those underlying beliefs that really make something like 20% time valuable? And then turnkeying that to the rest of your instruction, like your literacy instruction, like your close reading, like your project-based learning, and transferring that and embedding that in all you do. So I think there's a way to do both um, hand in hand. But at the end of the day, you have to have that rock solid instruction. Um, I, I firmly believe in that. You can't put the cart before the horse. Well, how does all this start? I mean, I, I, I'm I, I'm interested to know where you where you get these ideas from, or even how do you walk into a culture change? Is it just walking in and explaining to a teacher what the SAMR model is? Is it going in and saying, "Hey, I need you to do something differently"? Is it showing? Mm-hmm. Is it modeling? Is it getting everybody on Twitter? Where do you start if a district is looking to really take that step forward and do something innovative? 
I think one of the things I always say is that the lines between when an initiative exists and doesn't exist, they should be blurred. So if you're just going to drop an initiative on students during a professional develop, I'm sorry, on teachers during a professional development day and say, okay, this is our direction, then you're doing it wrong. I think, I think in order to blur those lines, a lot of it starts with really, you know, just getting into classrooms and having those small conversations with teachers, observing students, and basically just seeing, seeing what teachers need, seeing what students need, and kind of almost planting those seeds in a way. You know, how about we try this? Have you tried this? Not even just being an instructional coach, just having those conversations and seeing what comes up. For instance, I was in a teacher's classroom the other day, and one of the things that was came up was the use of social media and being able to do um, – more with less time, basically streamlining your workflow with things like Feedly, Instant Paper, Pocket, uh, things like that. So um, we had that small conversation. It was like impromptu. And lo and behold, you know, I went back to my office and I scheduled some professional development sessions in that area. So really blurring those lines. Also, one more example, um, an- another way to plant those seeds is, you know, through something like maybe even like a book study. So for instance, I know that, um, you know, sooner or later, we're going to have to approach standards-based grading, you know, and grading practices in our district. That's something that's like, you know, really, you know, the foundation of any really solid district is, you know, those those really effective standards-based grading practices. So one of the things I could do is I could wait three years and just drop it on teachers like it's a bomb, or I could have those preliminary conversations now, start by having book studies in certain pockets based on the work of maybe Ken O'Connor, Tom Gusky, and things like that. So when it actually becomes an initiative, you already have those teacher leaders in place and the conversation has already started. So I really think blurring those lines really helps. Let's take a look at that SAMR model. Um, I, you know, how, how do you describe it to teachers? I think, I think to sum it up is you're, you're leveraging technology to do things you couldn't otherwise do without it. Um, I think that's probably the best way to put it. And even before I knew what the SAMR model was, I think I learned about it back in 2010 or 2011. Um, even before I knew what it was, like that's what I was saying. Like if you're going to use technology, you should use it um, to do things that you couldn't otherwise do with the technology itself. I think that's the best way to put it. I don't think it's so much about, you know, memorizing the levels, like substitute, augment, modify, read the client. Like, you know, I've seen professional development, like sort of like web's death of knowledge where you're given certain activities and you have to classify them. I think, I think that's okay for a conceptual understanding. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but I think ultimately it comes down to just, you know, okay, I'm not using technology. Now I am using technology. Now me and my students could do something different. Um, I also think there's a lot of value too in just looking at the ways we do things, um, you know, from an authenticity standpoint. So for instance, um, like starting with, you know, we look, we use a lot of tools in school that are like made for school, like, you know, like kid blog and seesaw, those are two of them and they're great. But if I'm working with my students, I would rather have them use something like WordPress blogger medium, things like that, that adults use in the real, in, in the real world. And then, promote their work through social media channels like Twitter and Facebook. So a lot of times start with what's authentic Mm -hmm. and then modify or adapt it to work with your students. So that's something else that I think fits within the realm of the SAMR model. And is that something that should be written into the curriculum or is that something that you feel should be fluid because technology changes? I think it should be fluid because technology changes. I think if you're writing a curriculum, it's hard to really, even like a book or anything in general, it's hard to really, um, base it around certain technologies because you're right they 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 constantly change um and then you know i think it's um you know if you get married to a certain technology and then you know something else becomes effective um then that's a problem especially for teachers who might not be as uh you know well versed with technology it's like i spent all my time learning this now you're telling me to do this you know it's a great way to create enemies absolutely Uh, and, and and you see that in a lot of districts who aren't quite sure what to do, where to go. What advice would you give a school district that might be trying to figure out how to bring on initiatives, especially in the middle of the year? Any, any initiatives or, or technology initiatives or, or just in general? Or? You know, I, I still think there's a lot of school districts. And, you know, you talked to a lot of them. I talked to a lot of them where we want to keep pushing forward. Okay. But there's only so many hours in a teaching day. And we oh. all know teachers are just... So mm-hmm. bogged down, park is coming up, standardized testing is coming up, SATs are coming up, and here we are saying, all right, we're going to go Google, we're going to go Apple, we're going to do something. 
what -hmm. advice do you have? I mean, I know you're in on these meetings of of, of innovative and 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 technology efficiency. Mm -hmm. Talk to those superintendents out there that are listening that are like, I want to go one to one. I'm not sure yet. I I think a lot of it, um, you know, so if you're a superintendent and you want to go one to one or you want to get your district more involved in technology, I think a lot of it involves flattening the hierarchy and um, and having because there's all, you know, especially if you're on social media and Twitter, I know, you know, you're connected, I'm connected on Twitter and social media and really reaching out to people who know more than you do. Um, especially, you know, I found that being outside of the classroom, you really can't keep up on all the technology and these progressive initiatives and these, you know, these progressive tendencies when, when you're not really hands on with students all the time. It's really it's really difficult. So you really have to um, to set your ego aside, flatten the hierarchy and just talk to other teachers in your district and talk to teachers from other districts, um, you know, as equals and do everything to learn um, and do everything to learn what you can for the benefit of your students. Um so, you know, just, just, you know, even just like, you know, sending out emails like, hey, this is something we're interested in doing. You know, I'd like to put together a committee, reaching out to other people over Twitter. A lot of times I post, you know, anytime I have a question, I don't know, I just post it on Facebook. Hey, has anybody heard of this? You know, could somebody help me out? So if I'm a superintendent, I'm looking to go one to one. I'm going right to Facebook. You know, in a couple of years, if I'm a superintendent, that's not my plan. But and I want to go one to one in my new district, I'm posting to Facebook. Who's done this? Like, um, like you've said, like there's somebody out there for the majority of things for nine out of 10 things. They've done it before. Reach out to people in your district, reach out to people in other districts and see who's done. it. Well, I know there's a lot of districts out there that are looking for those resources and you guys have certainly created one. I want to bring up here your website, which is TL2020.org. Tell us a little bit about this website. What can we find on it? And uh, what was the genesis behind it all? So that's basically, um, it started with TL 2014 and now it's TL 2020, basically, you know, thinking long-term. Well, I think a lot of times in education, we, you know, we're managers and we focus on the day to day. And this is a great example of leadership from Randy and Lynn, my superintendent and assistant superintendent respectively. And out of TL 2020, um, this year, we started Innovate Salisbury, which is basically putting together a cohort of teachers, uh, 15 teachers, from around the district, from the elementary level to the high school level. We meet once a month and we basically just wrap our heads around innovative practices with the idea that these meetings and what we learn will then be turnkeyed as part of our vision for the district to decide where we wanna go and where we wanna be um, by 2020. So leadership, thinking long-term, a lot of what we've done is discussing what we want school to be like, um, you know, what our classrooms should look like and a lot of book studies as well, learning from experts. So let me see. So some of the books that we're reading, um, Pure Genius by Don Wetrick, um, Inquiry and Innovation by A.J. Giuliani, um, Gamification book by Matthew Farber, uh, some, of the, um, some of the grading work by Mark Barnes and Star Saxton, some of the makerspace work by Laura Fleming. And, um, and, um, and, and it's just been, you know, and those are some examples of, I'll say like Stephanie Harvey and Smokey Daniels inquiry based learning. So, and, and with, and all, and most of those instances, actually, Randy and Lynn have their own podcasts and they've interviewed those authors and they've made those podcasts available to the, to the teachers and they could receive, um, professional development hours for listening to them. So we've actually brought in a lot of those authors and um, interviewed them firsthand. But a lot of it's just about, you know, pushing this cohort forward, Mm -hmm. helping them lead the way, um, having, you know, them leading the way and then helping them helping us to define where we want to go next as a district. I I absolutely love the website here with everything. And I'm glad you mentioned the podcast. I've listened to a few episodes. You know, Randy and Lynn do an amazing job at putting everything together here. And that that website is tltalkradio.org. Love the logo. And, um, you know, the, the, the other neat thing I just love about this program here is they're very, very open for conversation. I mean, even right here, they've got a little uh, voicemail button. So if you have a question about an episode, you can talk right to the hosts mm-hmm. and get some information on anything that they're looking for here. Really, really neat stuff. I certainly highly recommend anybody reaching out to, uh, to, to Randy and Lynn here. And, um, you know, your Twitter feed here is great. Ross, when I'm looking at a website like this, who is the target audience? Is it the superintendent looking to move forward? Is it the teacher that wants to learn how to do one-to-one? Is it a tech director? 
who should come and see all of this stuff? Yeah, that, that's an that's an awesome question. I think it's you know it's it's anybody. It's it's really I think it's it's promoting best practice and it's promoting transparency. I think that's what it is. You know, not trying to operate behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. You know, we make mistakes just like everybody else. You know, like even within Innovate Salisbury, we've made mistakes, you know. Um, But just operating with complete and utter transparency so people know what's going on in the district. So it's not like at the end of the year, people are like, wait a minute, what's going on? Uh, What are you guys doing? You know, so I I think keeping those lines of communication open, I think that's absolutely huge for everybody in the district and for, you know, our board members. Um, our community members, just, you know, anybody and everybody who's involved in the district in one way or another could benefit from that transparency and the learning experiences that they've had from those hyperlinks and those podcasts. Um, and of course, you know, anybody from any other district could go in there and learn from that as well, like you said. Well, um, let, let me stop you right there when we're talking about, you know, community and creativity here. One of your tabs is parents. Mm-hmm. What kind of relationship do you have with the parents as a district? What kind of a relationship do the parents have with you? I mean, are these parents responsible for breakage of these devices? Are these parents responsible for, you know, attending meetings on how to do things, uh, tech support? What mm-hmm. kind of help and support do you provide at home? So this this is one of the things that we um we actually just talked about. We did a presentation. The three of us did a presentation together at uh in Hershey, um, at PNC, the Pennsylvania Educational Technology Conference, um, a couple weeks ago. And one of the things we talked about was leveraging social media to communicate with parents. So some of the things that we've tried to do is doing Twitter one on one sessions for parents at, at the middle school open house this year. Uh, Randy and I went into the middle school. Um, it was a late night. We went in. We did a Twitter one, uh, an optional Twitter one on one session for the parents at the middle school as part of open house. So we've had those public sessions available to parents. Um, Lynn and Randy have done um, like kind of like a uh, what do they call it? like a coffee talk type thing? Yep. You know, like, like mm-hmm. you know, like just just getting around having you know having coffee with them. But you got to do and, it with uh, the accent though. It's coffee talk. Coffee talk. Yeah, I I can't do voices. Um, so they've done that. And the other thing that they did, um, just visiting sessions as well. You know, just once again in regards to where we want to go as a district. And these are all things we planned. Um, created flyers, uh, pumped it up over social media. And to be to be honest, just like any other district. Um, or I would think most districts, you know, um, you know, sometimes you have trouble getting parents to attend. Um, so you kind of have to reassess your strategy, you know, um, you know, are you promoting this the right way? Is this what people need? But I def- I could say without hesitation that the creativity in regards to the content of the sessions and the effort is there in regards to trying to bring parents in. And to that, I really, I, I really applaud Lynn and Randy for doing that. Um, because, you know, we have, we have so many things to do on a daily basis, and they've really gone above and beyond in planning these sessions. Some of them have worked out, some of them not so much, but we'll continue to press forward. And um, if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. When it comes to the school district and the community, I want to pull, in, pull up a few things from a friend of both of ours, Eric Scheniger, and his philosophy of if you're constantly throwing out tons of positiveness – when those little negative things happen, it really does get overshadowed by the positiveness. Do you yeah. find the same thing is happening with all this great technology and innovation? Are you finding that the community in large is more forgiving when something does need a little bit of pushback or talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I think in general, that is the case. I heard, um, I heard uh, someone say, um, actually, it was last week that everything that's been done with the technology and with the innovation, um, you know, we're a smaller district. We're a smaller district, um, you know, kind of wedged between some larger districts. So, I, you know, I've heard, I heard this particular person say that, you know, what has been done with technology and innovation has really helped to put Salisbury on the map. And now people know who we are. And that's a credit to, to obviously the work that was done before I got here. I'm just jumping on writing on their coattails. Um, but I, I think because of that and people see the effort and people see the hours that are put in, yes, like I said, we make mistakes like everybody else, but I think when you have good intentions and you put in uh, the effort, when you do make mistakes, um, pe- people you know, tend to overlook them or they could tend to emphasize the positive. Because I, I, I do think it's very easy to say if you do, you know, nine things right and you do one thing wrong, it's very easy to look at the one thing that's wrong. But if you have those relationships, you have that transparency and you're putting in that diehard effort, um, 
you know, I, I think I think you have some of that social capital. And I think, you know, and I think that's probably what Eric would say. And and people are able to overlook those mistakes. So when it comes to twenty twenty and mm-hmm. where you're going for the next couple of years, how do you see curriculum is it advancing? Is it changing? Is it innovating? I'm not sure what the right word is on here, but where are you trying to mold the curriculum in your current position with K twelve teachers? Yeah, awesome. So I think um the majority of the work that I've done so far has been at the elementary level, some at the middle, not as much as the high school level. But um, as I get into, you know, hopefully I, I do, I will say over the next you know, year or two, like I'll definitely have more of a presence in all the schools and all the levels in the district. But to be honest, it's not even just, um, and I've had these talks with Randy, I've had these talks with Lynn. It's not about the innovation. Yes, the innovation is great. But to me, at the end of the day, it's about um, you know, just solid best practice, like I said before. And to me, you know, that inquiry based learning, I'm a firm believer of, um, you know, getting students to think, putting students at the center of the learning and getting them to, you know, and I, I kind of, my last blog post, I think it was titled, uh, inquiry is king. You know, to me, it's all about inquiry. That's where we do everything to get these students to think on a higher level. I mean, that's basically what it's about to me. That's why, you know, like I said, we, we do 20% of the time. That's where we do those FPMs. That's where we do those maker spaces. We want our students, you know, to be problem solvers. We want them to be able, you know, we, you know, the the whole word like growth mindset is so overused in education. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, But we want to get them to think on a higher level and be problem solvers and be able to persevere. That word grit, you know, once again, another word I'm kind of sick of is grit. But, you know, it's true. I mean, um, respect the iterative process. um, You know, you know, failure. I I don't want to say like we celebrate failure. It's, you know, it's part of the, you know, iteration is the new failure. I think that's what, you know, Tony Wagner, even I've heard like George Kuro say that um, or something to that extent. Um, but, you know, just getting them to be able to persevere, mm-hmm. um, be resilient and be problem solvers and just really that focus on inquiry based learning, I think, is absolutely huge. If you're not trying to get your students to understand concepts on a higher level, like what are you doing? Does, does, when we're talking innovation and stuff, does that come from curricular change curricular advancements does that come from better professional development more professional development the right kind of professional development and what does that look like i think it comes from modeling i think it comes from modeling as well modeling the culture of learning um, but i think it comes from shifts in professional development from the what to the sustainable how so you know i think a lot of times in professional development you focus on things that are kind of like Okay, we're going to do a session on differentiated instruction. Great. Like how many like how much long-term benefit if you're spending an entire professional development day on differentiated instruction, like are you really, you know, are you really get granted that is the how, but are you really going to get like long-term benefits from it? So I'm interested in, you know, those really um those those different categories and those different approaches that are going to produce long-term sustainable results, such as, you know, the writers workshop, the readers workshop. Uh you know, project-based learning, um, you know, just even something like web depth of knowledge, just creating this culture where teachers know and expect and, you know, just believe that the students um, should be learning, you know, on a higher level and getting away from that rote memorization. So a lot of the emphasis on the how as opposed to the what and just, you know, raising the expectations. I, I love the idea of the expectation raising and, and it kind of brings up a show that we did not too long ago about student portfolios and and really as a district we are looking k to 12 but we're really looking k to 16 as students get into that sophomore junior senior year what are you doing to prepare them for those next levels are you having them make student portfolios are you teaching them about resumes and websites are you focusing on college and career readiness what is a school district like you doing to help prepare kids for those 21st century colleges? Yeah. So some of the talks that we've had now involve a guaranteed and viable, some type of digital citizenship curriculum. Um, So I've been in talks with, you know, various connections that I have, you know, even like common sense media is the name that always comes up. Something that, you know, you're, it's guaranteed and viable and won't depend on what teacher you have. So, you know, you're in your district, you're in our district, you know, you're going to get this type of training. And, and even that, that's very difficult because, you know, what's out there on the internet is always changing. So what's relevant with, Dig, with Digit now might not be good like five years from now. But I think there has to be something formal in place rather than just leaving it up to the teacher. Um, in regards to student portfolios, I, I mean, I'm a huge advocate of students publishing their work, whether it's blogs, whether it's ebooks, uh, portfolios. 
And, um, you know, and there's no reason, especially in a one-to-one -one district, that everything that a student makes should, uh, should be living on the device, you know, should be living on the MacBook. So we've had talks about that as well. Um, you know, and then once again, like, you know, what kind of platform do you go with, you know, and, and how do you make sure that it's not just, you know, okay, you did your project, now just copy and paste it there and you're done. You know, how are you, how are you leveraging those portfolios to promote digital citizenship and even higher order thinking as a student to reflect upon the work that they've done? And of course, you know, we're looking at, you know, there's WordPress, there's Google Sites, there's Edublogs, um, you know, there's Blogger, um, there's Weebly. I mean, you know, but I, but I think, you know, the why needs to come before the, you know, the what in the technology, like why, you know, why are we doing this? Not just for students to just take a hundred projects. Okay. Now it's all in one place. That's great. But like, other than that, like, why are you doing it? How is it deepening student understanding? How is it getting them to become a better citizen? How is it, you know, further um, preparing them for college? We're talking today to Ross Cooper, the supervisor of instructional practice K-12 in Salisbury Township School District. I want to bring up a uh, an amazing website that I recently stumbled across when I was looking up information on project-based learning. Uh, talk to us a little bit about RossCoops31.com. Yeah, so so this actually, this is my personal blog. Um, it, start, it started about, about five years ago, I think. Um, it was actually originally, it was on Blogger, it was called... I think it was called like Ross Boss Teacher that blogspot dot com. I started that like five years ago, and you changed I think it was that about name two years ago. I migrated over to WordPress dot com, um, Ross Coops thirty one dot com, and then I think it was like October November um, after being inspired by some of my colleagues, um, namely Erin uh, Klein. I had a long conversation with her. She's like, you know, what are you doing? You need to be on self hosted WordPress, um, and I think I you know, even talked about it with you at that point in time as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I, I did it all myself. It, you know, it was not easy, but now I'm on self-hosted WordPress and, um, it, you know, it's, I mean, you know, just as well as I do and, and definitely better than I do that, you know, that is the way to go. Um, you know, I'm still learning. I'm proud of the fact that it all did it all myself. Um, but it really focuses, I've really narrowed the focus of it. And a lot of what I write, I try to blog one to two times a week, um, mostly about curriculum related topics and even narrowing it further. Um, project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, assessment and grading, you know, the professional development, effective professional development, those, you know, those core topics about which I'm passionate. And I think um, for the time being, I'm going to focus a lot on inquiry-based learning because that, you know, is, is something that I just strongly believe in. So, um, and, and I think, you know, I, I really enjoy blogging. Mm -hmm. um, helps me to reflect. Um, it's great to know I'm making a district, uh, a difference, not just in my district, but in other districts. And it's led to a lot of really good connections as well. Talk to us a little bit about those connections. What what have you picked up? I mean, you had mentioned the word earlier, connected educator. What do those two words mean to you? Well, um, yeah. So I th I think it, it means that you know you're not doing your job on your own. So it, it means that you have a community to um, you know to support you. And I think there's different. You know, my, one of my uh, good friends, Tony Sinanis, and you know, he talks about how there's different like levels and circles. And so you have the people you follow on Twitter, you have your colleagues, then you have your friends, and then you have your close friends. So there's all different levels and complexities to it. Um, but to me, it kind of started in 2011 when I joined the Apple Distinguished Educator Program. And I kind of, I kind of, to be honest, like in my school district as a teacher, I kind of was that, you know, square peg in the round hole. Um, I was, you know, I wanted to implement iPads. I wanted to do a lot of innovative things and there was some good stuff going on in my district, but I realized that, um, you know, I wanted something a little bit more. I wanted to get in touch with people who were really not just doing the most innovative things in my district, in my area, but around the country and around the world and really tapping into, uh, you know, your personal learning network, your PLN allows you to do that. So, um, just like you, you know, on a regular basis, I'm consistently, you know, collaborating with people who, um, you know, or some of the, you know, the most innovative educators from around the country. And it can't, it can't really, because of that, you, you I mean, you can't help but really up your game and, um, you know, become a better educator for it, not just for the support that they offer you, but for the resources and ideas. Um, and, and it's really, um, you know, it's, it's really, truly invaluable when you, sur I think it's the idea of really surrounding yourself with people who are better than you are. And then, and then, you know, supporting each other. That's really, to me, what it comes down to. So when you're an Apple Distinguished Educator working in an Apple Distinguished School, is it true that every time Apple runs a keynote, that's like a half day for you guys? 
<laughs> when, when Apple runs it, oh, when they do a, oh, you mean like when they reveal new products? I mean, do you guys all all, all gather in the auditorium and just just watch the wonder that is the iPad unveiling? You know, that would be awesome. I could I can honestly say I did that with my fourth grade students, and um, and you know, whenever there was uh, the last three or four years I taught, whenever there was, you know, it was only a couple times a year, I'd be like, you know, forget it. Let's let's see what's coming out from Apple, and if there was software that came out. You know, I'd get it in their hands as quickly as possible. But what we gravitated towards was actually analyzing their slides. So we would look at the slides of Steve Jobs. We would look at the jobs of uh, the slides of uh, Tim Cook. And we'd analyze their slide design and kind of create like student created rubrics from there and try to incorporate that into our own work. So, you know, making it a little bit more worthwhile in case those parents want to call and say, you know, you're wasting my child's time in school or something like that. It's just I'm not wasting my your child's time. I'm shopping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Ross, I want to say thank you for coming on. You know, we've been friends for a long time now. We we we've we've done camps together and 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 you know, the work that you're doing in the classroom is really really inspirational. I certainly want to encourage anybody to reach out and check out that uh, that website again. That is Ross Coops 31 that's r-o-s-s-c-o-o-p-s 31.com is that have any reference to baskin robbins i just need to know oh thir- no it's funny people ask about that um because 31 is everywhere um i played i played some street hockey in, in uh, high school and uh, that was my uh, that was my number nice. um i've actually had i've had i think ross coops 31 was my a- aol sign on when i was in like middle school and it's just it just stuck and um I'm fortunate that all everything and everything that I have is Ross Coops 31. It, it's kind of weird, but at least it's consistent, like, I guess, branding, so to speak, or whatever you want to call it. So um, so it helps. So, you know, right now, somebody out there in their car is trying to email Ross Coops 31 at AOL. Uh, prob- probably. <laughs> probably. Ross, before I let you go, I, I have a little uh, challenge for you. Uh, we usually do this on our educational podcasting show, but... Uh, I wanted to throw something at you called the Jersey Five. It's five questions to stump my favorite educators. Would you be yeah. interested in taking our challenge today? Sure. At this point, I have no choice, so let's go. <laughs> let's try it. What is your favorite Twitter address to follow or hashtag to follow and why? Oh, that's awesome. Um, wow. And, and you can favorite say, you, you can say Sean Junkins. That's okay. Oh, Sean Junkins? Um, you know, you know I'll, I'll throw out um, – you know, I'll throw out for um, for handles. You know, somebody who's really inspired me as of late, and I mentioned him earlier, is Tony Sananis. I'll throw him out there as someone that I've become really good friends with in the last half year. And it's actually his handle is at Tony Sananis. Um, and somebody who's really inspired me in the past year. Um, and, um, and if I'm going to go with my favorite... Uh, and, and by the way, Tony's an uh, elementary school principal... Of, uh, he was actually the uh, New York Elementary School principal, uh, New York Elementary School principal of the year, like last year in 2014. Um, I believe this year was actually my colleague Lisa Mead. Um, but yeah, he's a uh, principal of Kaniag Elementary School in Long Island. Um, as far as um, ha- hashtags, um, you know, I've been I've been doing ed tech chat, you know, for a while. I don't do it as much as I used to, but ed tech chat. Um, you know, the folks over there, um, you know, Tom Murray is a good friend of mine. Sharon Plant is awesome. Katrina Stevens, Susan Bearden, um, Alex Pachowski were the original crew. And I've been doing that chat, I think, longer than anything, along with Sat Chat, of course, the guys from Jersey, Brad, uh, Billy, and Scott. Nice. Question number two, what is your favorite educational tool to use, recommend, present on? Oh, Apple Keynote. Keynote. It has to be Keynote. Um, I started Duarte Present back in 2013. Um, you know, uh, Nancy Duarte, if you're not familiar with her work, awesome stuff on slide design. Saw her present. Um, I swear by Apple Keynote. I, I absolutely swear by Apple Keynote. Um, I'm, not, I'm not at the level of Adam Bello with his slides, but I think I make some pretty darn good slides. You, mean you don't have 435 tweets per second when you do your presentations? No, no. I'm still I'm amazed when, that, when I see that pop up. I love it's Apple just... Keynote. I, I and that's great. I, I sat in a. Uh, I'll throw out a name that I know you know. I sat in, in a uh, John Carippo presentation on Keynote, and just amazed. And I, I'm a big fan of Keynote. I, I I only use Google Slides when I'm trying to archive things, 
but I swear up and down by Keynote. I I think it's one of the best apps that really does need to get a little facelift here or there. Number yeah. three, best advice you've ever been given as an educator? Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, wow. I don't, I don't know. That's tough. I mean, I think if anything, one of the things I'm proud of is, is uh, you know, I, I think just, you know, anybody, I, I don't want to, you know, obviously, you know, um, you know, I've gotten my, any type of work ethic, whether you think it's good or bad, I've gotten it from my dad, you know, always pushing me to work hard. So I, th- I think, you know, someone like my dad or just anybody who pushes me to work hard, I know that's not very specific, but I think um, it's about, you know, working hard. And ultimately, I think, uh, you know, treating people the right way, I, I, I firmly believe. And I've been in districts where I either, you know, agree or disagree with what people are doing, and that's okay. But when I see people being mistreated, when I see teachers being mistreated by admin, when I see, you know, certain people acting like they're better than every, anybody else, like, you know, because I'm an administrator, you need to do this. I, I firmly believe in flattening the hierarchy, um, working together as equal. So any, I, I can't name anybody specifically, but anybody who's told me, you know, to work hard and treat people the right way, you know, like once again, my dad, um, you know, that's really probably the best advice I've got. I know that's like life advice, not specific education advice, but I think, I think it's one in the same. Nice. Number four, what do you hope your students remember about you when they graduate at the end of the year? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, wow. I, I think once again, you know, that I treated them, you know, and I made mistakes. I actually did a blog post a while back, my biggest regret as a teacher and how I could have treated my students better in some instances. So I did make mistakes. Um, but that um, that I treated them as equals and that I didn't talk, you know, even though I was dealing with fourth graders, I think a lot of my fourth graders would say that I, you know, one of my former parents put it best is that I let my pers- my true personality shine through when I was with my students. I didn't like try to become somebody else. I mean, that's good or bad, depending on whether you like my personality. But um, um, I think, uh, you know, letting my true personality shine through and treating, treating my students as equals and as people and not talking down to them and not lowering the expectations, but raising the bar and giving them the support they needed to meet it. Um, so, you know, treating them like, uh, like so, and also really, you know, getting them to really look back at the work that they did and say, wow, like, I, I just can't believe I did that. You know, after a year in fourth grade, like a year ago, there's no way I would have thought I would have, been a- would have been able to do those things. And now, you know, look at me now because of what Mr. Cooper taught me. One of the biggest compliments I got from a parent was, you know, when the students reach fifth grade, you could tell who was in your class and who wasn't. And to me, like, that's something that will always, you know, stick in the back of my mind. Once again, I made a lot of mistakes, but those are some of the things that I'm proud of. That's pretty cool. Um, Last but not least here, number five, what is the best teachable moment you've ever had? Wow, best teachable moment. These are are like deep. These are like the hardest five questions ever. Um, Hmm. You know, I'll say this. Um, I did a lot of things in my classroom that I was proud of, but I was always particularly proud of the things that I was able to do that was able to affect my district as a whole. So in a district of seven, seven or eight elementary school, I think, I think of seven. Um, one of the things I brought to the district um, before, a couple years before I left was something called the daily five, which is basically a structure for balanced literacy. And, um, you know, I got the book. Um, I kind of promoted it with the right people. Like, you know, all know these people, if you get it in the hands of this person, it's going to make a difference because this person is like the squeaky wheel. This person could make a difference. So I got it in the hands of the right people. And from there, it just kind of snowballed. And now I'm two years removed from my district and across all seven, um, across all seven elementary schools in that district, I think it's seven, um, some form of the daily five is being in, implemented in one way or another. So as a fourth grade teacher, I was able to do something sustainable that, is still affecting so many darn uh, teachers and students in that district, you know, a couple years after I've left. And to me, you know, I take a lot of pride in that. That's pretty cool. I'm going to throw one more at you. Favorite song, <laughs> favorite song lyric. Favorite song lyric. Oh, awesome. Um, favorite song, um, Grateful Dead, Terrapin Station. Um, it's my favorite song. 
And I've actually, I put this, I'm starting to put this at the end of some of my slide decks. I'm doing a, a cheap plug. I'm doing a webinar next week. Um, and I'm taking some of the slides that I previously did for a keynote. And it says one of the lines from therapist station is his job is to shed light, not to master, um, you know, sung by Jerry Garcia written along with Robert Hunter. We did a lot of Jerry's lyrics with him. And I think, you know, his job is to shed light, not to master. It's basically saying me coming in here and working with you. Um, I bring certain experiences to the table. And so I might have these ideas as to what we should do and what we shouldn't do, but your experiences are just as valuable as mine. So though, you know, I'm, I'm, and it basically, you know, it speaks to inquiry. Like I'm shedding light. I'm telling you what I know based on my experiences, but I'm not going to master this for you. It's up to you to decide what you want to do. Everything I, I have said today, uh, feel free to take it with a grain of salt because I don't want to discredit what you're bringing to the table and your experiences and your values and beliefs. So I'm, I'm actually thinking about putting that, um, at the end of a lot of, you know, a lot of my slide decks for my keynotes and my presentations, just, you know, to get people to believe in themselves and not necessarily what I'm coming in to dispel. That I think is a great way to end a podcast right there. Ross, thank you so much for coming on today. One more time, where can we find you and the great work happening at Salisbury Township School District? So the TL2020.org website that you brought up. Um, and even if you just Google Salisbury, I think it's, uh, I think the main website is stsd.org salisbury township school district.org stsd.org um then you have the tl2020.org website that you brought up so anything from there you know it's all connected it's all one digital hub and um and my work is um rosscoops31.com and at rosscoops31 on twitter and aol.com apparently as well <laughs> so if you are out there running Netscape, he is the guy to talk to. Thank you so much, Ross, for stopping by here. And uh, there's, of course, several great things happening on TeacherCast. I, I want to, before leaving here, just mention a few things. Our brand new site, uh, Beyond the Hour of Code, is now live. And uh, our buddy Sam Patterson just released his book. It's available on Amazon. If you're a teacher out there looking to bring coding into the classroom, I highly recommend it. BeyondTheHourOfCode.com. It is an amazing book. You can certainly pre-order it right now over at beyondthehourofcode.com slash Amazon. If you're looking at bringing in STEM, coding, programming, anything to your school, um, check it out today. We just released a great Tech Educator podcast, episode 111, all with Sam and all about the great stuff that he's doing in the classroom. Certainly check it out. There's, of course, several great ways that you can participate in TeacherCast each and every day. You can, of course, reach out on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And we love it when you subscribe to our iTunes and YouTube channel over at TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and TeacherCast.net slash YouTube. And while you're there, please click the subscribe button, download everything that we're doing, and leave us a nice review and five-star rating. This show is only possible by viewers like you. My name is Jeff Bradbury. On behalf of everybody here on the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network, keep, it, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.